Hello and welcome to this forum. We are here at the IWCLL 2017 in very rainy New York City. Uh, we've just had a very interesting session thinking about the biology and etiology of CLL. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Olivier Bernard from the Institut Roussy in France and uh, Stefan Stilgenbauer from the University of Ulm. So very interesting sessions thinking about the science that underpins what we now know um, about uh, CLL. So I think a couple of things for us to think about is firstly the scientific content, but more importantly for us to then go on and think about how does that science impact the way we're going to think about how we want to treat um, CLL in the future. So you um, talked um, to us today about this, the, the, the cell of origin of CLL. How, how, just kind of you take us through what were the, the salient features of, of, of your presentation. I think we were able to track down the initial mutation to uh, cells that are able to undergo both lymphoid and myeloid differentiation. Mm -hmm. So that suggests that the bona fide CLL derived from cells that are already mutated, mm -hmm. not from uh, wild type cells, mm -hmm. and that may have impact on, on the D depending on the real s on, on the real uh, cellular fraction that is affected, uh, to, uh, that could impact on, on the kinetic of, of the disease and maybe uh, treatment response and all these sort of things. Sure. Now we saw in the se subsequent session um, Chris Oakes talking about the epigenetic types or the epitypes of CLL and then how it looks as if the epigenetic changes that occur within the cell all seem to derive from potentially the cell, the, the cell from which that cell arrived. So <laughs> how, how do you kind of integrate your findings with the kind of the findings from the epigenetics? Uh, depending on, again, on, on the very uh, initial cell that is mutated and the strengths, so-called strengths of the oncogenic mutation, you, ha you might have a different uh, arrest at different step of mm. the B-cell differentiation. And from that, different, uh, for example, mutated or un unmutated CLL. Thinking, of course, about what are the early events uh, in those kind of events. So Carlo, of course, all Carlo Croce always likes to present that the, we, we're talking about mere 15, 16 mm. TCL1. I think many of us feel that might be a, a, a nice simplified oversimplification of a, of a complex process. But in terms, do you find it a useful model, uh, Stefan, to think about the indolent versus aggressive types as being two distinct types? Or do you kind of feel that you think of a, of a spectrum of disease uh, in between these cases? Sure, I think, you know, we, we need to come up with models like uh, mm. Olivier did, and uh, biology is becoming more and more complex. Still, we have to bring it down to a, you know, comprehensible level to uh, get our work done every day. Um, I think, uh, you know, particularly in the days when we uh, target um, biology now with, with our treatments, um, uh, we need to rethink some concepts because what has been true with chemotherapy in the past uh, may not hold true with these novel agents. Um, so to rethink um, the picture in a bit more, you know, complex and self-reflective way may help to further enhance uh, the, the tools that we, we have in hand uh, therapeutically today. In terms of thinking of the genetic landscape of CLL, the one thing that stands out in CLL is that, in fact, among the cancers, it's, it's relatively a small number of mutations that drive it, but despite that, still a good deal of heterogeneity. I, I was struck by the Kath presentation that Kathy Wu had about looking in particular about those cases that change over time and how the subclonal architecture changes, presumably due to increased proliferative growth of some kind of genetic um, subtypes of cells within there. These kind of changes might make it difficult to think that true targeted approaches are going to be quite difficult in CLL and that we probably need things that target the pathways like the abrutinib and meneticlax that we have mm. and that it's going to be quite difficult to have true targeted therapies targeting the genetic changes. Mm. Uh, what, what do you feel about, about that? 
Sure. I mean, as you say, you know, they are the kind of the underlying disease drivers mm -hmm. that the natural history is dictated maybe by. But then we have that dramatic influence of therapy again, where, you know, we always have to remind ourselves that 17P and TP53 mutation testing is so critical in practice. But then there may be other things emerging like BTK mutations or PLC gamma 2 mutations conferring resistance to abrutinib. And we haven't observed these mutations as, um, let's say, pure cancer drivers in the disease per se, but they only emerge with a particular type of treatment, adding another layer of complexity, I think, to the whole thing. So we were brought up to believe very much so that the real way we're going to succeed to cure cancers is by eradicating the, 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 the true stem cell. What are, you, are, you, are you seeing or hearing anything that makes you believe that we're any closer to being able to, in this disease, go back and target the stem cell? Or are we always going to be left eradicating more proliferative clones from which the root is there and, and more subclones are going to develop? For sure, I think uh, having identified the initial mutation that are still, uh, the on which the cells are still dependent allow for specific treatment, but there are not so many of them in the very initial mutation. You can have maybe 10 that could uh, resume in a couple of pathways. So mm. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able mm. to target specifically those cells. Mm. Now, another talk, of course, this morning was on this whole question of familial CLL and its, its components. A lot of my patients who have other family members with CLL are always very worried about are their children going to be affected with the disease also. Anything you're hearing from Richard Holston this morning that gives you any clues as to what are the, the gene, the familial associated genes that we can be looking for? And are we any closer to being able to screen for those patients who might be at increased risk the way we can for, say, familial breast cancer? I think it's different between uh, mm. familial breast cancer and CLL because... Because we don't have a BRCA1 gene which is... Different. Exactly, yeah. and it, it's, in a way it's a very strong oncogene. Mm. And the gene that uh, Richard told about are apparently genes that are involved in B-cell or immune differentiation. Mm. So I think it's a, we're at the crosstalk between uh, immunity, cellular transformation and autoimmunity and mm. all these sort of disease. And mm. That it's a long way, but uh... right. I think, and adding to that is is kind of what what Tay Chanafel talked about the the whole story about MBL. Mm -hmm. So I mean, with CLL, we probably just see the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because when you look really sensitively among the 80 or 90 year olds, um, you have almost everybody having clonal yeah. B cell expansions, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I mean. Looking at that, you know, the whole disposition or susceptibility discussion, you know, in the end, when we just all become 150 years old, probably we'll all run around with some B cell clones. I know so. I refuse to have my own blood typed <laughs> anymore now that I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so I said we'd come back to be thinking about was there anything you heard in this morning's talk? Interesting it was in terms of thinking of the biology and how we've made huge advances in terms of understanding the, you know, the, the basic biology of what occurs in CLL. Anything you heard this morning that you think is going to have potential implications for how we think about or treat CLL? I guess Kathy uh, got asked questions about the whole aspect of whether there, were, there was anything there that could predict who we shouldn't watch and wait, but may be able to come in to prevent some of these clones emerging. You, of course, from the German CLL study group have done exactly that study and we're waiting to see the answers. Do you think that might be the way forward, Stefan? Well, I definitely believe so. We need to understand disease biology better. I mean, genetics has provided quite a bit of clue. Um, there's the whole immunology field that we will talk uh, later in this meeting about, the new treatments. Um, we know that with uh, you know, FCR already, we have this subgroup of patients with mutated V-genes, maybe and trisomy 12, who have these very long-term remissions, sometimes MRD negative. Uh, I hate to use the cure word here, but um, clearly we have these patients out 20 years now without detectable disease. And then we have uh, all these new agents that we can combine with each other or use sequentially. So clearly we need a biology to guide their use en route, I think, to cure of the disease. See, I don't, I don't hate using the word cure at all. I think that's absolutely well, what we want to be going after. Sure, absolutely. absolutely. No, I'd like to be able to say we could find it. Well, you, you hate to use it because you don't want to be um, over-enthusiastic. Over yeah. But the data is beginning to look more and more mature. Absolutely. And I think the finding that all of those patients do appear to have eradication of MRD must be, um, must be important. 
In terms of looking at MRD, we look at MRD often by flow, looking at specific um, changes. Would you believe that the, the, the CLL stem cell might be much more difficult to pick up in those sorts of way? And are we using the wrong kind of assays for MRD to really ask the question, are we eradicating that cell? I think we are, uh, we are tracking the, the real disease mm. in the, the CLL cell that accumulate. Mm -hmm. But the original cell might be somewhere, we don't know yet, probably in the marrow but also could be uh, some place in the lymph node in periphery, but that's something we need to find mm. out. Mm. Mm. The cells that are uh, driving evo CLL evolution. So there you have it, a uh, sum up from the first uh, session of the IWCLL 2017 uh, meeting. Really good scientific advances showing us just how much progress we've made understanding all of the changes that are occurring within the CLL cells and ways in which we're starting to use those to think about how we're going to treat patients in the future. So come back, see other sessions reviewing the rest of the progress from IWCLL 2017.